Right now, David Bland is here. Thanks for coming, man. Thanks for having me. And before we start, do you want to? We're gonna. David's gonna send out a message because David has a lot of followers on the, on the interweb, and he's gonna let them know that Sound we're doing this live. live. Just retweeted. There we go. There we go. All right. So now millions of people will be watching. Uh, at least tens. <laughs> That's ten more than we had before. Okay. So um, you. Well, before we talk about the main topic. Can yeah. you explain to the folks who are watching, if they're not familiar with you or with your company, what the focus of your work is and kind of what you're passionate about this? Yeah, uh, I'm really focused on building businesses that matter. So okay. uh, I kind of grew up in the Agile community. So my first startup, uh, our CTO was like, you're Agile, end of training. <laughs> <laughs> and that was around 2000, 2001. Okay. That I got thrown in kind of the deep end as okay. a designer and developer. And uh, I had to learn on my own and then learned a ton of bad habits. And then over the years, I just, Finally started to sink in what it was about. And then uh, I got really frustrated because I was at three different startups. And um, uh, two of them kind of iteratively uh, delivered things that nobody cared about. Okay. So we're doing Agile. We're like, ah, oh, feeling really good about things. And then uh, we implode because nobody cared at all what we were building. Okay. So um, kind of pulled, pulled me back a little bit and say, OK, well, can we apply this stuff upstream you know, so we can build stuff that people care about too? Right. You know, we can build it the right way, but are we building the right thing? And uh, that's where I'm drawn to now. So almost all my work is uh, new product development or uh, some kind of new enhancement to a business. Okay. How do you test that before you build out your backlog? So okay. I'm kind of pulled really far upstream. Um, but here at the conference, I'm trying to say, how do you connect that? Like, okay. How do you decide what you put in your backlog? So that's, that's what I do. So, so Lean Startup is a big, I know that's a big part of the way that you're approaching the work. Um, how does that, with the clients that you work with, how does that factor in? I mean, are they, they mostly startups that you're doing now, or is it larger companies? Like, what kind of organizations are you helping get? It's mostly larger companies at the moment. Okay. I still do uh, some uh, advising in, in Silicon Valley with accelerators out there. Um, and startups go through in waves, so I get in front of waves of startups, like 40, 50 startups at a time, which okay. is nice. Uh, and that's always fun for me because startups you are just watch which so ones passionate. fall apart. And <laughs> Most <laughs> nine out of ten fall apart you probably. Picking, I got ten on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they, they reach out afterwards. It's nice. Um, okay. I advise some uh, a few around the world, but um, most of my business are corporations. Like, what would we do if we couldn't sell our product anymore? How okay. would we survive as a business? Or uh, what if what happens if retail goes away and that's our only channel? What do we do? Okay. So I'm pulled in to say, well, let's not just freak out about that. Right. Um, Let's actually design a business that you know, builds on what you already do well today, but, but in another a different way. to stand on. Yeah, so like, okay. what if it's a service and not a product? What would that look like? So it's a lot of, when I, when I pull from lean startup and also design thinking, it's very much, how do you apply a scientific method and a process to that? Okay. Because you want to be repeatable, because you're gonna crank through a bunch of different ideas. How do you make that a repeatable process? Okay. So one idea is you know, a terrible idea and it fails, well, you don't fire anybody, step one. Right. <laughs> don't fire the team. <laughs> and step two, like, how do you pull in another idea and form a team around it and run with it? Okay. So I'll have you know, like five to 10 teams all working through ideas. And um, you know, some of them work, some of them don't. And some of them end up in a very different place. So okay. it's a lot of fun for me. OK, so, so I want to back it up a little bit. For the sure. folks, uh, assuming that some folks may not be already totally up to speed on lean startup design thinking, can you first? Kind of briefly explain what lean startup is, or how you would how yeah. would you explain it to somebody brand new to it that's never heard of it before? I, I view it as scientific method applied to business. Okay. So how would you um, deal with extreme uncertainty? Okay. So I pull a lot from Eric Ries, who wrote Lean Startup, and it's basically like how do you make that a repeatable process? Do you what's your assumption? Do you have a hypothesis you could create where you could test? The biggest difference I see is like sometimes you have assumptions, but they're hard to test. Okay. But if you could create that in a testable form, what would that look like? And then how do you actually go experiment in the market? And how do you do that quickly and faster than anybody? Because basically you want to do that faster than your competition. You want to do that faster than any of the other startups so are competing with you. So you adapt quicker. Because what happens is like you learn faster than everybody else. And if you can put that learning into action, you know, they become reactive to you versus you being reactive to them. So this is a very, I mean, to me, it seems like a very different mindset than a lot of companies still have where it's build the thing faster. But you're talking about structuring an organization. We've talked about this before. Like the, the, the thing that you're trying to craft is maybe not the actual product, but the way that you get to the product, right? Right. And so often we, we throw the product away uh, early on. And I know that's kind of people gasp and they go, wait, we, can't, we built something. We can't throw it away, possibly. You know, we have right. to iterate on it. And I think um, maybe those cases we jump to Agile maybe too quickly where we say, OK, uh, let's iterate on that idea and keep doing sprints after sprints. Dead horse into yeah, it's like we had a terrible idea, and then we iterate on it, and it's, now it's an OK idea. And it's never really a business. So right. 
um, how do you actually uh, stay wide enough so maybe we experiment on three or four ideas okay. and um, you know, use data to inform whether or not we actually keep going. So if, if you were going to switch from one idea to, let's say, four, and you were going to iterate, you know, iterate on all of them, well, maybe only one of them is going to be the one that you end up going with. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know that at the outset. I can see where a lot of people would argue that all that other, those other three, that's waste. But it's not, from the approach that you take, it's not waste because of the knowledge, right? Because of the learning, okay. yeah. And I've really grappled with that kind of internally for a long time because I thought, oh wait, we're doing something we're throwing away, that's waste. But if you're learning, is it really waste? Um, you know, when I worked with Toyota in the past, uh, they had this statement I really loved. It was like, if we're not learning, it's waste. <laughs> and okay. I said, wow, that's kind of like, that nails it for me because I, I honestly think, um, you know, I, I want to, I, we have a lot of waste in the software community right now. Right. And uh, we don't see it because it's not stacked up. Like we don't print out our code and see it stacked up and, and see it as waste. Right. But it's all those long weekends and nights we spend creating stuff that nobody cares about. All the technical debt. Uh, or, or doesn't even make into a product, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm very sensitive to that, but I feel like if you're learning from it and you spin that learning into you know, the org, that uh, I, I don't view it as waste if you learned. Okay. So I'd rather, uh, and then also the flip side of that is, well, what if you invested $20 million in that idea and then people worked on it for two years and then it failed? And nobody wanted Like, that's yeah. a lot more waste. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and you've you kind of wasted all your time uh, developing something that nobody cared about. So. Do you think that there is some waste that is good waste? Yeah, I feel like this is where um, I, I end up kind of turning the lean community on its head. Because I use this term valuable waste, and they're like, what is valuable waste? There's no such thing. But there is. I mean, if you're learning from it, and it's not, uh, you know, it's not stuff you're just developing because you were told to develop something, right? right. Uh, I feel like, yeah, it's some waste is more valuable than others. Well, I, so I, it's, I was, it's really tough. I think of it like body fat. Like, you, nobody wants fat. Fat's bad. But if you don't have any body fat, you're going to die. Yeah, you're going to be really you, cold. Yeah, and you, but you need so, so some of that waste, if it's generating knowledge, maybe you can't sell the knowledge that you gain, but that knowledge will lead you to the more valuable thing that you can sell, right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I use, um, so a lot of my clients are now using like internal VC funding. Okay. So imagine a corporation that sets aside 2 to $5 million and says, we're going to fund new ideas. And we know most of these are going to fail, but we're going to have cross-functional teams, that's product design, engineering, and we're going to give them a runway, and they're right. going to actually go work on this in the market. And then we're going to have a review with our internal board, and we're going to decide to pivot, persevere, or kill that initiative based on you know, what they learned and what they recommend and what we recommend. Okay. So it's really interesting. I'm kind of setting up almost like an internal VC model in these companies yeah. where the board is reviewing you know, how many people did you talk to, and what did you launch in the market, and what did you learn, and what do you recommend? Because okay. the board has, you know, if you think of um, the executive team, they should have pretty broad uh, perspective as far as like where the company is and does this align to the vision of the company yeah and um, but it's, it's nice to have a conversation where if we all agree it's not a, a not a good opportunity the the, the VP could say okay I, I don't think we should go forward on this yeah. and nobody gets fired and what's the other ideas you guys want to work on you know it's so that I mean to me that the, the scare the safety thing about getting fired or I can see where the company would be really worried about creating something that's going to negatively impact their brand if and when they end up killing it. Like there's, you've got to create some kind of box there, right, to protect everything. Yeah, sometimes um, my clients end up experimenting off-brand, so they okay. don't put their logo on it, and so they don't damage their brand. Because the idea, uh, well, it's really hard to put, as, as people, it's really hard to put something out there. If you're a designer, it like, has to be perfect, or if you're an engineer, you don't want to have a bunch of tech debt, right. or if you're a product person, it has to be like the perfect product in a way. Um, so we have all these negative, we have all these things fighting against these urges of put something out there to learn yeah. that's not quite finished, and um, I find it really interesting because it's ultimately it's like a customer that judges value. Right. Like we have our own internal standards, but in the end, you got this perfectly shiny, well coded, like beautifully designed thing that the customer looks at and says that doesn't solve any of my problems. Right. So the customer is our ultimate judge, right? Okay. Um, so. It, so going off brand, right? It, it kind of uh, it's like a pressure release in a way because yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to like go through all the branding reviews right. and legal reviews. I mean, you have to do some of that, but it's 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 like Safer. you know six months you're going yeah. through all these reviews, but I can get something out in six days, right? Or, okay. So it's really interesting the speed at which we can get stuff out, and um, without the brand, it's like does the idea stand on its own merit? Yeah. So does it really solve a problem? Can you launch it? out there and see if anybody cares, right. and where would you find those people? It, it really challenges the team to think more kind of like a startup, even though they're not yeah. really. But I mean, they're, they're, the culture 
is sorted like that. So you got Lean Startup over here, and they want to use Agile to get there. Mm -hmm. And then there's the big gap in the middle with design thinking, which is how you're getting from one side to the other, right? It depends. So with okay. design thinking, I feel like, um, so design thinking's been around a while, should, right? There's you a should maybe tell them what it is. Oh, too. design thinking, um, if you want to have a deeper dive on design thinking, just look at anything the Stanford D School puts out, because it's all out there online, all the IP. Um, IDEO, they have IDEO University now, but it's basically like the idea of you would kind of do observational research, empathize with people, ideate, and then kind of go wide. And this thing's like go wide and then decide. That's okay. what I learned from Janice Frazier. So it's like, you want to have, like, what are the uh, possible options? Every option you could think of. And then how do we prototype and test <coughs> Okay. And um, I feel like the overlap between design thinking and lean startups is really big because okay. um, uh, you're really testing new ideas in the market. I think where they maybe differ is that um, uh, design thinking has been around a while and people have their kind of um, set, I don't want to say they're set in their ways, but they have their mental model of how it should work. Okay. And then... Um, they don't always test the prototype with real customers in a way that I would with lean startups. So for okay. example, you might have a prototype that you're testing internally and things, but in, in, when I'm using lean startup, I want something instrumented with analytics that I test in the market to see okay. qualitative and quantitative, is there a signal? And I think, uh, but over, overall, I think there's an awful uh, big overlap between okay. the two. And I think they benefit, um, we can benefit from using them together. But both of, the, both of them are used to basically uh, help discover what you're going to build with Agile. This is how okay. I use them. So this, this is a big difference, too, because it, it would be, I can see where a lot of people would say, I'm going to figure out what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. Go build it really fast using Agile or something like that. Mm -hmm. But you've got all the knowledge gathering from the lean startup stuff. And then where you end up might not be where you think you want to go. Right. So I think what I see more and more in my clients, which is really troubling to me, is that they buy in on design thinking. And they have like some really high, uh, you know, high-end firms come in and help them to create all this, uh, all these artifacts from all these like ethnographic research and all that stuff they've done. And then they go, okay, create a backlog and build it. And, and in between there is uh, product design. I mean, it's like it's really tough to take that big stack of stuff about customers and their pains and gains and problems right. and actually make a product out of that or a business or a service, right? So um, I, I find that um, that gap right now is, yeah. is, is a pretty fatal gap in most of corporations I see. Filled with assumptions. Yeah, because they, didn't, they just took that and they kind of made a backlog and then they started delivering. Yeah. And I think um, where I pull in more lean startup and other testing methods is just what can we do to kind of test some of that stuff right. and then maybe hack together some things that we test in the market more okay. before we uh, actually go build a backlog and start scaling things. Okay. So I think, but the mindset is like, uh, we got a big stack of stuff. We're not sure how actionable it is, but let's either use it or not, and then create a backlog yeah. <laughs> and burn down that backlog. And I think you don't it's even scary. know if it's the right answer to the question. You don't. Yeah. So I feel like uh, in Agile we go really narrow really quickly, and then we just iterate, right? Okay. And I feel like if you narrow it in on something that was a terrible idea, and you just iterate on it, it's like eventually you'll make it an okay idea. But but theoretically you're getting feedback somewhere along. With Hopefully, it yeah. From somebody, unless the person who's telling you what to do. To me, there's this thing where a lot of people seem to feel like they're Steve Jobs and they, they know what everybody wants before they need to know and they're going to tell you, I understand the problem, I looked at all the research, here's the solution. Yeah. Well, being in the Bay Area, I get a lot of, uh, well, Steve Jobs, yeah, I'm sure or I'm talking. like Steve Jobs, right. or Elon Musk is the new Steve Jobs, by yeah. the way, if you're just wondering out there in the world, <laughs> uh, Elon Musk is now the new Steve Jobs. Anyway, um, but what I, what, with the people, I, I haven't personally worked with Apple, but the people I've talked to that, that have, yeah. they said, you know, Steve Jobs had this... Um, this, this ability to infer what people wanted based on the interaction. Right. And I think that, I mean, that's like a superpower, right? right. Like well, if you could talk to customers. They're not all, if, not everyone has that power. So if you're talking to customers and they're talking about the problem spaces and how they try to solve it today and all this stuff, but then you can infer from that what you should do in design, like that's, that's amazing. And if and Elon I think, Musk can figure out we all really need that Hyperloop thing. Yeah, like he sees a problem and he knows we can't come up with a Hyperloop, but he feels like, well, I can infer from that what it should be. Yeah. And, and not everybody has that ability, right? So I think the, the flip side is like, you know, when I'm helping startups in the Valley, it's kind of like, well, Steve Jobs didn't talk to customers or we're like, you know, like we don't need to talk to customers. And it, like, even if you don't do what they recommend you do, it's not the customer's job to build your product for you right. or tell you what it, how it should work. But you need that contact of like, what are the real world problems they're trying to solve? Yeah. Or what are they struggling with? Or, you know, what, how could it be better in ways they can't even imagine? But, um, the idea that you would just not talk to them or interact with them in any way, I think, is uh, 
is wrong because yeah. eventually, like if you get it right, you're a genius, right? So I didn't talk to customers. I built this thing. It's amazing. It's billions of dollars. Well, that's amazing, but you got it right. I mean, how many of us get it wrong? Yeah. And how, just, are you sure you can get it right again? Yeah, and most can't. If you look, yeah. like, it's really tough for founders who had a really big win. It's like the first hit album, and then the second one's like, eh. Yeah, yeah, it's tough to <laughs> repeat that magic, right? So I think um, we could have a sense of humility of, let's talk to customers. It doesn't mean we do exactly what they want, or everything, okay. but we, we need to be connected to them when we're designing something, because ideally we're you know, trying to build something that matters. Okay, so if... If most of this, well, I would say on the Agile side, it begins in software. Some of the stuff that Eric wrote in the, bad, in the beginning of the book, very software-oriented. Um, this is extending, I'm assuming, well beyond just that space. It is. A lot of my um, work at, right now is in co companies I wouldn't, well, some of them don't use software almost at all, okay. and others are, are I wouldn't consider software-first companies. Okay. So uh, consumer packaged goods, um, automotive, industrial companies. Okay. Like, imagine you've, um, you've done really well building devices to do things in, in, in uh, manufacturing and on lines. And now, you know, your, your phone comes out and people are like, why can't I just use my phone to do that? And, and the company's like paralyzed, you know. <laughs> like, Wait, we built this amazing device that does it. Like, yeah, 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 that's nice, but I want to do this on my phone. Yeah. I mean, how do you even respond to that as an organization? It's like, we're not a software shop. How do, right. Is it possible to do it on the phone? Like, the mechanics of the iPhone, like, will it even actually be able to do the thing that we do with the precision? It's, it's crazy. So, um, and then retail, I mean, retail's um, you know, having ups and downs here in the economy. It's yeah. like, how do you have a better retail experience um, with consumer packaged goods or people that I'm working with that have products. So this is the one that I want to, because I know a little bit about this, so I want to... Yeah, they're, they're worried that retail might go away, and if that's your only channel to distribute your product, like, what do you do? Like, okay. shouldn't you start figuring that out now if, before something may happen? So it's not design of a new cereal or whatever, it is how do we get it to the store? Yeah, so like, okay. I mean... The, or not, if there's no store, how do we get it to the customer? Well, so for example, I mean, I guess... Everyone likes to talk about Nespresso because you know they had the patents for that machine since like the 70s, okay. and then they were doing kind of B to B. But when they went mass market, it was they had to figure out what their channels would be, right? So online, offline, retail. How do we get it in, in the hands of customers? Right. Um, and that's when they. So it was kind of the same product, but the business model they changed and they took off. Um, and I think other organizations are in the same spot where they have all this amazing domain knowledge and they have a product. It's probably pretty good. Right. But if the market shifts, like, what do they do? Because you... Like, what if you're Nike and suddenly you decide we're not going to sell shoes there anymore? Yeah, like, so how does Nike make money if they don't sell shoes? Yeah. Or if they can't sell or shoes? Or if they only... I think it's Amazon. They're only going to sell them through Amazon now or something like that. Yeah, they're working on some interesting stuff. Um, Nike Labs is um, working on some interesting things. But okay. I'm just saying it's not unique to Nike or Nespresso or other... Or I mean, software. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of um, companies out there who have a lot of great creativity and they have domain knowledge. It's just the way they've configured their company... It's all like, we do this one thing, we do it really well, better than anybody, and the market rewards us for that. It's like, okay, well, what happens when the market changes or well, that channel goes away, what do you do? I mean, to me, it almost seems like a risk, a risk management thing. Like, we have this thing that's going great, yeah. how can we kill it? Or, or what ways can we find vulnerabilities where we can create something to destroy part of it? Is that? Yeah, I mean, like, look at the automotive companies. I mean, eventually, car sales are going to plateau, maybe right. even decline, and then we have ride sharing and autonomous and wherever that brings us. Um, what do you do? Yeah. Like, are you a mobility company now? Or do you get in the ride-sharing business? Well, and, Even and though the, that, the that goes against your car sales? Or, you know, it's, they're using lean startup and stuff like that to figure yeah. out how to break through this wall. Mm -hmm. So if, they want, if the larger companies want to stay competitive, they need some technique for doing this. Yeah, so it's really, um, the companies I work with, it's not they don't have kind of this entrepreneurial spirit. It's just more, they have some folks that have never been in a startup before, or they're just not sure like what they should do yeah. to go test these ideas. So what I try to do is kind of draw from my startup experience, but also uh, because I've helped a lot of big companies, I want to be respectful of, well, you can't do some of the things startups would do uh, or it'll destroy your brand or destroy yeah. your company. It's like you can't test the need for something with a cancelable purchase order. Yeah. And, and basically, for those of you who don't know, it's like you would craft up a purchase order that looks real and uh, it describes what you do by magic and you go to your biggest client, let's say it's a $100 million client, and you go, Will you sign this? This is what we're working on. And they go, yep, and they sign it. And then you go back and you go, okay, they really want it. Let's cancel this, and then we'll figure out how to build it someday. It's like, <laughs> what do you think you're going to do? That, like the client, you just lost a $100 million client. <laughs> no, a startup doesn't care, right? right? A startup's like, whatever, there are other clients out there. You know, 
And so the, the risk tolerance from you know um, a corporation is very different than a startup. Yeah. And I just respect that. I mean, it's it's okay. But it's also I think I think it's the, the mindset that if it's if it's a startup and they're following that approach, they're figuring out. And when we talked about it before, I kind of came to this point where I feel like, well, it's, so it's not about the thing we're building. We're building the company. That's the actual product. We just have this thing we produce that we mm -hmm. sell. It's a very different mindset than we have this big thing that's been around forever. We make X. That's yeah, I mean, you're trying to re-envision it. I mean, it might look like a product at the start because you're just trying to test like um, solution fit, right? right? But then eventually you want to create a business out of that. And I think if you, um, if you frame it like Horizons, like Horizon 1, 2, and 3, so Horizon 1 is kind of like your cash cow, been around forever, you know, you measure an ROI. Right. And then Horizon 2 is more about kind of growth and scaling. And it's, it's a business, but it's not quite a uh, legitimate business within the company. And then Horizon 3 being hey, there's something we, we're not really sure. We're just playing in this white space and trying to figure out is there, is there any opportunity, okay. right? So if you look at that framing, it's not perfect, but it, it works well enough. Um, so in, in Horizon 3, you're doing a lot of experimentation in the market, but once you find something, it's like, hey, I think there's a revenue model here. It needs to be, start becoming a business and starts to be um, integrated into the company in a way where you can actually like grow that, right? Okay. And I think, um, you know, if I look forward, I see once people learn how to do this in Horizon 3, which I'm trying to help them with, the, the another big challenge is like, how do you actually integrate it to the business? Okay. Because uh, you look at all the labs that get shut down, right? Like Nordstrom Lab and in the, in the Valley, some of the labs have been defunded and it's usually because they come up with some really cool stuff, but then just can't quite find a spot in the business for it to right. take root. Or it, it competes with other people's domain and they actively find undermine and kill it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there are problems with it, but I think, um, you know, I, well, I, just, th I mean, you're creating an, a threat internally to the thing that you already have. Yeah, I mean, if it's successful, it could replace what you do today. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, it depends on the culture of the company. They want to keep their jobs. They want to keep their jobs the way they are, I should say. Some, yeah, yeah. Some of them do. Um, so I know that you have a lot of people that, that follow you and follow the work you do, and they're pretty hip with all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But what if, for somebody who's um, watching the video that has been just coming to this stuff for the first time, how would you recommend that they start, like it's, I'm a middle manager, whatever, I'm like, this sounds like we need to do this. Mm -hmm. How do I start those conversations? Well, I, I think it's, um, I try to use uh, like metrics judo. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so like middle managers usually have all these things you have to measure yeah. to be successful. And what I'm finding is that, like the trends now, um, if we need to work a different way, we're gonna have to measure different things. Okay. And I think that's really tough because if you say, we're gonna work a different way, and then you don't give them anything to measure, I feel like the, the middle layer of a company is just gonna revolt against you. And if you. you need an example, take away the Gantt chart, tell them we're switching to Agile and don't give them anything. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's one way. I mean, it's not like I've ever experienced this. But anyway, so I found that um, if you can give them other things to measure yeah. that are different indicators of progress, that helps. So like, um, you know, I use pirate metrics and things like that, like acquisition, activation, retention, referral revenue. Um, how many experiments are we running? How many customers are we talking to? Um, you, can, you can come up with different measurements that they realize like, oh, these are just like other things we'd measure. Yeah. And then you have this conversation of, okay, can we actually measure those in this company? And then how would we report progress? So rather than say, hey, we're on scope, on time, but like yeah. these are the features, the dates, we're good. It's more like, well, what are the outcomes of those? And uh, how would we measure those? It, it, it shifts the conversation, but they don't completely shut you down usually. Yeah. It's usually, you kind of, it's like this prey. I call it, that's why I call it judo, because it's like, <clears throat> here are other metrics, here innovation metrics, or you know, here are other things you need to think about because we can't just mar measure ROI and feature release. Yeah. So <clears throat> I almost wish this was audio because I'm going to ask you a question. I don't know if you're going to want to answer it or if it's going to be a total disaster, but it's fine. Um, with that measuring, like when, when I'm talking to a team that's trying to switch over to Agile, I have yeah. different ways that I show them you can do reporting, different things you can capture, and I say, don't go ask them what do you want, because they only have certain answers to those questions, like utilization gantry or whatever. Just like if they're building a product, they have certain things they look at. I try to explain, like, you have to know enough for you to understand what you think is going on, but just the fact that you're watching 18 different things lets them know, oh, somebody's watching something. Like, you just talked about all these different metrics, which may not mean anything to them, but they see that somebody's really focusing on that. Do you think that that takes away some of the stress, even if they don't understand what the metrics are? I think so. I mean, I mean, it, it's like in baby steps, right? So yeah. I think if you can give them just a little nudge in the direction you want them to go, but not in a way, 
I don't know, not to get all like psychology, but you're, you're trying to. Um, so it is social engineering. You in are a way, doing, If you yeah. say pyrometrics, and they're like, "Ah, I have no idea what that is," but yeah. that sounds cool. Good, really keep funny, measuring. Because pyrometrics is pretty known <laughs> in the startup community for a while. It's like uh, maybe even ten years old now. I'm kind of dating okay. myself here. But um, most corporations have no idea of the framework. And then I might call it something else, right? It's like I, I just call it like. Well, here's a, here's a framework you could use to High measure. High acquisition metrics. Whatever. But anyway, it's the same stuff, but it's like, we might call it engagement rather than activation or whatever. Okay. But in the end, it's like, where are we trying to move the needle? Yeah. Right? So like, if you have a team, and they've been cranking out features for months, and uh, you're still losing users, Yeah. Right. then maybe we'd pause and say, well, why are we losing users? Like, can we focus some efforts into that engagement number, okay. so that churn? And can we reduce churn by releasing very focused things okay. and measuring? And, then, and I found that middle management is all over that. They're like, yes, if it's a number and it's supposed to change <laughs> this way, it's great. I'll measure yeah. that. And versus saying, we're going to do lean startup experimentation. And we're gonna, I mean, I, um, I try not to, I mean, I'm excited about working in these methods. Yeah. But I think at the people I'm talking to are, are more like, what are the outcomes and how is this going to affect me personally? Okay. So I try to steer it towards the, you know, to, to that way, okay. and then we back into it and say, "Well, we're going to do some. We're going to work a little different way." Okay. But um, yeah, I feel like giving them things to measure yeah. that are actually measures of progress, other than ROI and feature completion, could be one way to win them over. Okay. Cool. So, if people want to learn more about you and learn more about the company, where should they go to do that? Yeah. So I have my own company uh, in the Bay Area. It's Precoil.com. So okay. P-R-E-C-O-I-L.com. And then um, on Twitter, at David J. Bland. Cool. Um, and I'm just uh, pretty visible. I try to put everything I'm working you're, on out. You're and, big in this. Yeah, I'm kind of big visible. That's an inside <laughs> joke there. Um, I, I actually uh, put a lot of my stuff under Creative Commons, so okay. people just run with it. So here, you know, I was doing some assumptions work and mapping. Uh, people just run with it. I had people come up to me in the hallway and say, I used that thing in, for like 10 teams, and it was amazing. I was like... Great, like write about it or tell me. I yeah. mean, I usually tell don't someone. get that feedback, you know? <laughs> and, it, and so I just put it out there and, I, and it's kind of like, well, maybe people use it or not. Yeah. I personally find value out of it, but I try to put, like, if you go to my website, I have uh, templates and videos and all kinds of stuff for free that people can, can run with. Cool. All right, dude, thanks for coming by. It was really great to see you. Again. Thank you. And keep watching. All week, we're going to be doing live interviews with folks who are here at the conference, and thanks for watching.